All right, so we have a room full of CEOs. So here's a job opportunity for you. How would you like to run a business with really thin margins, with high fixed costs, with really low return on invested capital, and a lot of government regulation, and a customer experience that is influenced partially by people who don't even work for you, like mm, TSA agents? <laughs> Any takers? <laughs> Um, you know, seriously, if you're like me and Warren, uh, despite all of the hassles of air travel, there is something still so exciting and glamorous about the industry, and we're lucky enough today uh, to be able to uh, meet Ed Bastian, who is the CEO of Delta, which last time I checked uh, was the second largest airline in the world. Ed started out, we got a lot of finance people here, Ed started out as uh, in 1998 with Delta as VP Finance and Controller and the rest is history. He became CFO and then President and then as of last May uh, was promoted to CEO. So please join me in welcoming Ed Bastian, we're thrilled to have you. Yeah, it's a little it's, precarious getting up those. It is, it is. Maybe we need like an airline safety announcement. We need some kind of rail or something there, exactly. <laughs> so Ed, thank you so much for being here. And um, I guess I thought it would be fun to start from the beginning, since your beginning is so interesting. So you grew up the oldest of nine kids in Poughkeepsie, New York. Poughkeepsie, New York. Yeah, your father uh, was a dentist working he, out of the house. Your mom was. was his dental hygienist. She worked and for the, him. She worked for him. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I guess the first time you ever got on an airplane was when you were 25. 25 years old. So, so tell us about that. So who would have thought, right? And what's that? Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Not exactly a CEO out of central casting. So tell us about that and, and how your early experience uh, affected the way you lead today? Well, it, the, uh, it being one of nine and my dad and mom both working in the house was my incentive to get out of the house as quick as I could. So, <laughs> so I, le I left home when I was 18 and went to a small school in upstate New York, St. Bonaventure. I know I have a fellow St. Bonaventure uh, alum out there somewhere. There he is, Ed, in the background. Um, and uh, haven't been home since, uh, but it's been, a, uh, it's been a great ride. Yeah. My, uh, my parents had a, uh, it, while we didn't, we didn't have the financial means to fly and do things. You know, they, they certainly instilled a, uh, a spirit of discipline and focus and confidence in the, your ability to take on challenges, and I think that's why I'm here. Yeah, that's great. So I, I did talk um, just now about how tough the business is. Yeah. I mean, what, what for you attracted you to the airline industry, and you know, just why do you stay? Well, I spent half of my career actually outside the airline industry. I was a traveler. I, I worked at Price Waterhouse originally in my career, and then I spent eight years working for PepsiCo. And so, and I was a heavy-duty business traveler. So I already thought I knew how the airlines worked and how yeah, screwed we all up did. they That's what we all how, think. how screwed up they were. And I thought it'd be easy to come work for one and fix everything. And you get on the other side of the curtain, you realize it's not that simple. But the uh, the airline industry does have a have a glamour to it. It's you're out on the edge. You're you're it's a global company. You're influenced by everything, or so it seems that's going on in the world at large. And but it's also at the same time such a vitally important facet of our of our uh, economy of our of life. Mm -hmm. As I tell people, our mission in life is to make the world a smaller place. Yeah. And it's a noble mission. And and you know, when. Society today and the world that today seems so divisive and people are polarized and people are pulling away. It's our task actually to step into that, you know, to build bridges, not walls. And that's, that's how I look at my job and that's what, that's what our goal at Delta is. Oh, that's great. That's, um, that's really inspirational. Um, you just said, though, that um, when you get on the other side, you realize how tough it is. So what do you think we don't know about the challenges of running an airline? Well, it's, it's a, it is a high capital uh, cost. But one of the things that happened in the airline industry about uh, 10 years ago is many of them went through a bankruptcy process. And we did, and just about every, every large airline has done that sometime in their history. In fact, most major airlines are no longer here. Uh, you know, you think about Eastern or Braniff or TWA or Pan Am. <clears throat> the list goes on and on and on. And one of the challenges the industry had was it didn't have enough scale and size to it. it was a very, it's a very competitive market, still is. And we needed to somehow consolidate, restructure, get our, get our uh, organizations to the point where we're competing 
on quality of service rather than who can have the lowest fare. I mean, fare is always going to be important, but quality of service is, is, is to us the most important attribute on which to compete. And we're doing that now. And as a result, we've been successful. Delta just finished in 2016. We had as our highest profit in our history. We, we made $6 billion, 15% uh, margin. So it's not too bad for a low margin business. And uh, we're returning to capital. And as, but more important than any of that is we're taking good care of our people. And what they're doing to take good care of our customers is, uh, is legendary. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about you know, the post 9-11, that whole save the airline era. You weren't the CEO of Delta at the time, but you were certainly a, a senior person kind of taking the airline out of, out of bankruptcy. Right, right. Well, we, uh, bankruptcy is a difficult place to be, but it, it gave us a second shot at life. And uh, there's something about uh, getting a fresh start, and there was something about the bankruptcy laws that, that allow you to, to re, redesign and reimagine your business model legally. Um, that, that allowed us to do that. And we weren't the only airlines that have gone through that. Americans gone through that. United has gone through that same, uh, the same exercise. But following that, we, we decided to uh, merge with Northwest Airlines. And we created at that time, which was the largest airline in the world. And we're now, as, as American bought US Air and other consolidation events have occurred, the airlines were, you know, were knocking on the door of, to be number one once more. But the, again, the most important thing of all that is the financial structure and stability of the industry is in a really solid place. You have, in the US, you have four big major carriers that have about 80% market share, all of whom are of, of similar size. So we, all, we compete, but we also have our own ability to invest in ourselves. And, and it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good industrial construct. Yeah. Um, in, in 2004, though, you left I did. the company and then came back six months later. I did. So well, it's why hard to you explain to my wife, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I have, I've had a passion for the company. It's, it's, a, it's a great company and uh, it's got a great culture. Unfortunately, in the aftermath of 9-11, I thought the company was making some really silly decisions and was in a, a cost-cutting drive to save itself. Unfortunately, the costs that they were taking were out of the people of the airline that were needing to go out and inspire customers to, to, to prefer the product versus the other way around. And it was a, it was a vicious cycle. And once you get on that, that, that negative spiral down, downward spiral, I didn't want to be the one having to pick up the remains of the company and, and, uh, and, and, and declare defeat. So I, I, I decided I couldn't, I couldn't work so for said, a company I quit. that I didn't, I didn't believe in. You didn't I, have to I, fire I, me, I quit. I did, I did. And, wow. uh, and had a great job that I went to. Uh, six months later, the CEO called me and said, asked me to come back. I wanted to come back because I knew what we needed to do to fix it. He put me in charge of the restructuring as the CFO at the time. I took a 50% pay cut to quit, to, to come, so it was really hard. To, <laughs> now to, your to, wife to, really thinks she's crazy. To, to go to a company that was filing for bankruptcy and yeah. take a 50% pay cut at the same time, but uh, it was the best decision I ever took. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And um, so to, to what do you attribute your, your success? You talked about consolidation. Yep. What else is going on? You, do have a, you're, you went from bankruptcy and, and now you've got a profitable airline that you're trying to grow. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've got great people. We really do. And I know everyone in here uh, has a great affinity for their people. And in the airline space, we'd like to think we've got the best people in the business. And we've got 80,000 yeah. of them. Uh, they do really well. Uh, they've done well financially. We've been able to restore the, uh, the, the earnings levels of, of all 80,000, which was one of my goals. In fact, from the merger, which was in 2008 till today, we've been able to increase the overall compensation of all 80,000 people by 80%. I don't know there's another company on the planet that's increased their employee compensation by 80% across the board for everybody. And one of the things we did is we instituted a profit sharing plan when we went through the hard times, because we had to take pay cuts and make some adjustments. And we told them that once we got this thing sorted out again, our employees would be the first to participate in our success. So from first dollar of profits, 15% of the profits go back to the employees of Delta Airlines. And this past Valentine's we pay it on Valentine's Day every year. This past Valentine's Day, we distributed $1.1 billion to the, to the employees. None of the management participated. It's all just the employees. And it's the third year in a row we've been over a billion dollars of profit sharing. We haven't found a company yet anywhere, forget airline, that's paid a billion once. We've done it three years in a row. And that alignment with the people and the morale, and it's, it's, it's really been fabulous. 
Yeah, I want to I want to just share with everybody some of the numbers because you're you're known uh, you as a CEO are known for being so focused on your employees. So here are the statistics. Last year, you lifted the base pay of your hourly workers nearly 15 percent. Uh, you paid out profit sharing bonuses averaging out to 21 percent of people's salaries. I'm looking over there because I know there's a delta table. So it must be all the smiling people over there. Uh, and you more recently announced another 6% increase in pay. And yep. you're meeting with as many of your 80,000 uh, employees as possible all the time. So I have two questions. One is, can I have a job? <laughs> and uh, the other, uh, seriously, I mean, what gives? What, what's the deal there with that? And how do you talk about that with your board? Well, we, uh, we, we state with our board, it's, it's our, our first goal is to take good care of our people. You know, we think about the airline business and we think about airplanes and we think about exotic locations and the glamour and the technology and the fancy airports. But for us, everybody has that. What they don't have and the only competitive advantage that we have in our industry is our people and our culture. And when you, so you talk to me, I'm going to talk about people. I'm not going to talk about airplanes. Airplanes are interesting, I can talk airplanes, but what I want to talk about is people, because we're a service business, and we serve people. We and the leadership serve our 80,000 so that they can serve you, our customers, and the better job they do is going to serve our owners. And we had uh, Mr. Buffett just buy 9% of Delta recently, and yeah. I think that's a great, uh, great testament to our people. Yeah, that's for sure. So um, I guess Warren Buffett used to call the airline industry a death trap. Yeah. He just put... Eight billion into the industry, and three billion of it went into Delta. He did. So, have you talked to him about why he invested, and what did he tell you his thesis is? Uh, I haven't had a chance to talk to him yet. He's, he's invited me to to come see him, and I'll I'll, I'll certainly do that. We've exchanged a couple of notes uh, back and forth. What what he shared with me, the reason why he invested in Delta was that was, was that service mentality, is that you know people that take great pride in their people are people that he wants to invest in. In, in terms of the product and the customer base. He's invested in other airlines as well because he sees the overall industry model getting better and it's a time for him to participate. So he hasn't made a specific call on Delta, but Delta has been, was the largest part of his, uh, of his investment. So I'm, I'm real proud of that. But we'll, that's great, we'll no be pressure. We'll, we'll be meeting soon. Yeah, that's fantastic. We'll be meeting soon. When you say that, I mean, that sounds easy, mm -hmm. right? We have great people and they have a service mentality and we tell them they're the most important thing and we reflect that in their paycheck. What else do you have to do well, the to, to make that happen? Sure. Well, the, the, the most important thing you, that we had to do is we had to fix the business. You know, we, we always, these are the same people that were here when the business was failing, too. And so we had to fix the business, and we've done that. And we've been on a task for the last 10 years to, to deliver the, the highest quality experience for our customers of any airline in the globe, and we're doing that. So in 2016, one of the metrics that we measure is what we call cancel-free days. Because we know the biggest pinch point for customers is when a plane cancels. You think about it, that's, that's, oh, you know, yeah. and the, then people throw their hands in the air. And by the way, it's, it's a terrible thing for your employees too. Because then they have 200 frustrated people that they got to reaccommodate and rebook. And so we said, we're going to cancel cancellations. And that's crazy to say, you know, in an industry as challenging as ours, we fly our main line, our, our, our main jets, 3,000 times a day, 3,000 flights. In 2016, we had 241 days of the year without a cancellation. 241 days. If you were to take all of our big competitors combined, American, United, Southwest, and add them all together, we had four times they had all combined. And so you talk about that as a competitive advantage in terms of putting your money and your people, and so whether it's with our maintenance expertise, our, our predictive, you know, we use a lot of technology in terms of modeling, where, because we don't, it's not that we have the latest technology or airplanes, although we actually have some of the oldest uh, equipment in the industry. We, we, we took that approach. And then the next step is that, well, we've got to get people there on time. We know that the greatest correlation between customer satisfaction and net promoter score, which is what we use to measure, measure our, uh, our, our uh, customer evaluations, what I get evaluated, my bonus is based on what you, how you think about us, is getting people there exactly on time. It was, it was arrival within zero. The government, interestingly, says arrivals, you're on time if you're 14 minutes late. It's a kind of an old government legacy. So we're actually we're on a campaign with the government to try to change that. We said, no, on time should mean, I know when I'm late by 14 minutes, my wife doesn't give me a pass, <laughs> right? and nor should you give us a pass. Yeah. So, uh, so in 2016, we were on time as measured by the government, 86% of the time, highest in our history, highest of any of the majors. But that meant we were still late 
25% of the time, if you go to true A0. And so we're going to move that up. And we continue to introduce more and more. We introduced uh, bag tag technology using RFID this year for the first time. Again, it doesn't sound very, very exotic from a technology standpoint. It's been around forever. But we've been able to figure it out as a price point. So we now know where everyone's bags are. Real time, so I tell we never really lose bags. We just misplace them from time to time. You know, we, we always find them. But at Delta, our bag scores are by far the lowest within the industry. So when you put all those tools in place, and there's many, many more for your people, and we're investing in airports, and we're investing in our sky clubs, we're investing in our, our airplanes and technology, you actually give your employees the opportunity to serve and to be gracious and to see how they can help rather than having to apologize for what went wrong. And, you've, and you, you do, I'm a big believer in a tipping point, and we had a tipping point a few years ago where we had enough concentration, enough improvement that people started to actually enjoy serving people once again. And that's what they do best. That's what we hired them to do. And not having to apologize when something's wrong. And that's, I think, and then, we, and then we're just feeding the momentum every year and continue to invest. We're investing heavily in the business this year. We'll invest $4 billion in our company, highest in our history. Uh, we take... For every dollar we make in the company, we take 50 cents of that and put it back in the product, back into the, into the business itself, and the other 50 cents to pay down debt and to continue to improve our capital structure. We had, uh, five years ago, we had $20 billion of debt. Today, we're down to $6 billion of debt and going down to $4 billion over the next couple of years, which for a $40 billion revenue company, it's a pretty, it's a pretty healthy, uh, healthy ratio. Yeah. Um, so that's our philosophy. Yeah. Um, one of the things I read about in terms of your strategic priorities, you said you had three. Uh, to be the most reliable and customer-centric airline, you've talked a little bit about that, to expand, to expand your global footprint, and to strive to become the airline of choice for the next generation of travelers. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what you think you need to do with the next generation. Well, that's, uh, that's a constant. Uh, Struggle and analysis trying to figure out. I, I own three millennials myself, and I don't know. Maybe all of, maybe all of you have a better look in trying to understand them. I'm sure them. they I'm, think that you own them. I, I, uh, I, I certainly don't understand them from time to time. But we, uh, and we talk about the millennials as the next generation. They, they are the now generation, right? I mean, there's 35% yeah. of, our, of our traveling base is of the millennial uh, generation, and an increasingly higher portion of the, uh, our emerging high value customers, you know, the heavy travelers. And you know, what we, we, we know in the airline business is that you build relationships with airlines. You know, it's, it's, it's sometimes a love-hate relationship, but you know, airlines have a big influence on your life. They have a big influence on where you're going, big influence around your business, your ability to do business, to, to travel. You travel for lots of reasons. You travel for great things, you travel for sad things, and sometimes just, just, just work. Um, so you're, you're constantly traveling. And one of the great you know, experiments of, of our government was the deregulation of the industry 25, uh, more than that, 40 years ago at this point. And we brought airfares and made them affordable now. And, and every single year, year on year, the one thing you can count on is airfares are down. In fact, airfares this year are down 5% over where they were just a year ago. And we continue to drive airfare and air travel more affordable, making it more available to the masses. And as a result, the millennials are growing up with, with, with travel, thinking nothing of it, you know, jumping right. on a plane and going wherever. Uh, they're, a, they're, a, uh, they're a generation that values experiences rather than owning things. They want to do things. Uh, so we think our industry is a perfect industry for that. And we want to build the, 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 the relationship with them so that we think that's a relationship that they can carry for life. So that Delta will be their airline of choice for many years to come. You know, they value transparency. They value quality. They, they want to be connected. We're spending an awful lot of time trying to get people connected in the sky. We don't do a great job of it, you know, yet in the airline industry. We, our, our product's called GoGo. -Go. I call them no-go, you know, the Wi-Fi. <laughs> um, and I tell, tell them I'm not going to call them GoGo -Go until they are GoGo. -Go. But we've got, we've got, we've got new <laughs> Wi-Fi technology that we're putting on throughout all of our planes. We've got, we got 1,200 planes, so it takes some time. And they all have to be specially certified because we're, we're drilling holes into the roof of the plane. So you guys, the FAA is, gets very nervous when we drill holes right, take your time, on the top. Take your exactly. Time. And that's, so it takes six months just to get a fleet type certified. But as we're doing that, we've got new 2KU band technology that gives you the same streaming capacity in the skies on the ground. And we've got to figure out a way to make it the same price point, which is free. Yeah. And so if we do that on large scale, I know a couple of our smaller competitors have that, but if we do it on an international scale, that's going to be another game changer. And I think it's going to be important to this generation. Yeah, I mean, speaking of game changing and technology, I mean, what about, what about the future of air travel? I mean, I'm still waiting for my George Jetson 
<laughs> private, yeah. you know, flying car, I guess that's what they were called. I yeah. mean, how do you, where will we be 10 years from now? I, I think you'll be looking at much of the same. Okay, I, 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 you know, I, I own a Tesla, so I, I, uh, I, I enjoy uh, looking at some of the new innovation in travel. Uh, I don't think you'll, I mean, and, and there's no self question. Self-driving, there, there, self-driving. There, there, well, there's no question. That's where it'll eventually go. They'll go to, to, to these, these cars are going to fly someday. I don't know it's in 10 years and probably not in my lifetime, but at some point in time, you'll have highways in the sky rather than on, just on the ground. Um, but the, the, the challenge with it is that we've made air travel affordable to the masses. This past year, we had 180 million customers that we served worldwide. Uh, second highest in the globe, and this coming year, I think, will be the highest in the globe, will pass American. And when you have 180, I mean, the price point to be able to deliver that service, it's going to be really hard for the technology to ever get there. So supersonic travel or flying into space or f flying self I mean, that's, that's probably going to happen, but it's so far off because the price point you're going to need to make people want to actually accommodate. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we're partners with Richard Branson. Branson has uh, Virgin uh, Galactic as one of his things, but we own um, Virgin Atlantic. So we own 49% of Virgin Atlantic. He owns 51%. I just spent a couple days on his island with him last week. And uh, he's having, in Virgin Galactic, he's got a, he's got a you know, fly, he wants to fly someone into space. And he's got, I think he's got about 1,000 people already have made deposits to go into space. But those deposits are $250,000 a person. Mm -hmm. That's not a, you know, that's not a model that's going to that's gonna challenge our, uh, our industry anytime soon. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, before we take questions from the audience, I just have to ask you about January 30th at 7.16 a.m. Uh, when the President of the United States tweeted it's in our the new midst world. of the, uh, yeah, that's right. So in the midst of the immigration ban, uh, President Trump said, quote, uh, only 109 people out of 325,000 were detained and held for questioning. The big problem at the airports was caused by the Delta computer outage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How was that morning for you? You want me to say anything? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, it was 48 hours after the immigration uh, executive order had already come out, yeah. so it's kind of hard to understand how that was the, the, the in, in impetus for people, you know, protesting and picketing outside the airports. Listen, you, um, you smile and you go on. Yeah. <laughs> you um, smile and, and you go on. A lot of people <laughs> wanted me to stand up and uh, you, just, you just keep going. Yeah. Um, you were among the, a group of airline letter, uh, leaders that met with the president a couple of weeks ago. I and, did. you know, what was that like? You know, is there anything confidential that you'd like to share with us? <laughs> this, in, this intimate group. He's a, uh, yeah, he's the same person you see, you know, in, in, in on, on uh, campaigning as well as in meeting, which is, he's a, he's, he's, listen, put personal politics aside, right? Yeah. And um, the one thing I will say about, about the president that I drew from the meeting was the message he was sending to us and to me was that I want you to tell the politicians what they need to do, rather than the politicians telling you what you need to do to work for them, to make them successful. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's flipped it on its head. And, and whether this model works or not, you know, jury's out, who knows. But he's trying to run the country like a business. It's the only thing he knows, right? And he's surrounding himself with some really smart business people yeah. who are accomplished and skilled in their own right. And for years, I've always had people come up and say, well, why don't you run for this? Or why, don't, why doesn't the business community put its best, best minds out there to help solve the issues in our economy or the issues? Well, guys, we're doing it. It's happening now. So we'll see how it goes. But it was, a, uh, it was an encouraging meeting. It was one that I think things will get done. I think it's probably going to take more time than uh, expectations now. They don't have the people staffed and the, the, the cabinets. Departments are still looking for people to, to, to wor start working with, but it was, there, was a, there was a positive atmosphere, and for, as a, as a business leader, for me to be in the White House with, with the president within less, of, uh, less than a month of him being inaugurated was awesome, yeah. right? It was awesome, and unfortunately, we never had that experience with the prior administration, and I think this is an administration that we're going to do our very best to, to work with. Yeah. Did you talk about the privatization of air traffic controllers? We did. We did. Uh, we talked about that, uh, talked about his trillion dollar infrastructure 
uh, plan for the country. I've, I've had a couple of meetings since with the, the, the fellows, the people that are, that are, are, are starting to put that together. Um, there's many, many things that we can do. Uh, airport infrastructure needs to be improved in this country, and many of the cities and the communities are doing that. In fact, Delta's doing that. We're leading the way. We've got $12 billion of airport projects going on as we speak over the next five years. We're building the new LaGuardia together with Governor Cuomo and the Port Authority. We've got a new airport going up out in Los Angeles this spring. We're going to be moving to the other side of the field. A new airport in Salt Lake City, a new international terminal in Seattle, and uh, a $6 billion renovation in Atlanta, Hartsfield Jackson, the largest airport in the world. So we're doing what we say, and the public-private partnerships are a big part of that, the funding, but at the end of the day, all the funding has to come back. We're the, we're, we pay for it all, because you know, we're the ones that, that have to bring the customers in. It's our home, and we want to make it as accommodating. And the thing that I'm most excited about all that innovation is that we're going to be building the airports for tomorrow, not simply replacing the airports of today. We're on a, this, this has been 30 years since we've had the opportunity to recreate the airport experience. When you think about it, you know, everything that's happened in the past around security and the difficult, you know, we can bring biometrics to play. We can, we can take light technology sensors to help message people and get crowds moving in the better direction. We can bring new amenities to bear. We need to make the airport experience as, as, as accommodating as we can because we know people spend a lot of time there. That's our sky clubs need to be, you know, clubs that people want to come to, a reason to fly Delta. So we're, we're investing heavily in that, and air traffic control and, and the congestion in the sky is something that needs to be solved. Uh, Next-gen technology, it's, it's a, probably a $50 billion price tag. It's a huge price tag. It's a price tag that the government doesn't have funds for. But when you do the math and you realize the value that can be created and, and fuel efficiency and time and, and the environmental factors, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. But we don't have a government institution in place today that can accommodate such a long-range plan with funding that's guaranteed. Unfortunately, we keep having to go back through the same budgetary process with the FAA. They have to get reauthorized year after year. And it's, you, can't, you can't run a long-term project with a short-term uh, budget like that. Yeah. Do you spend time thinking about the TSA part? I mean, that is part of your customer experience. I do. I spend a lot of time. You know, the, while the TSA owns the experience, we own the customers, so that's just a that's just a part of the travel ribbon. So we we try to do our very best, and and they have done. I'll give you credit; they have done a, a, a tremendous amount in the last part of last year. You know, last summer everyone was worried that TSA was the lines were starting to get long, and they had screwed up the staffing formula. Well, we sit on them airport by airport to make sure. And I know Boston here is one of the more challenging uh, 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 line weights and, and infrastructure, and we're still spending time working with the airports. NTSA to improve upon that, but we are doing. We we brought uh, innovation lanes uh, into into our airport down in Atlanta, and we're in the process of rolling them out throughout all of the system, where you can have five people taking their stuff off or things out of their bags all at the same time, and it all going into a central chute rather than kind of having this sequential one by one and somebody going through and somebody trips something and stopping the line. We've we've shown that we can accelerate the throughput by 50 percent with the existing space, with the existing personnel, with the new technology. Delta paid for it. We put $10 million of our own capital. Even though it's government, supposedly government funded, we're still waiting to get the check back. Uh, we don't care because <laughs> we, we know what's what our customers want and that's, that's a real important technology. But as we're redesigning airports for the future, we're going to be involved in that. Hmm. But biometrics, I think, are going to be a big key. Yeah. To, yeah. Be, to be smart screening, not just, not just, uh, ran, you know, just random, which is unfortunately the way it gets done today. Yeah. I have a quick question for you while we, um, if you have, let's take some questions from the audience. And while people are thinking about what they want to ask, I did look, um, I Googled you, and it says if you want to write an email to Ed Bastian, it's edwardbastian at delta.com. Like, really? Is that your email address? And would you respond to me? No, if it's I write not. You? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's close to that, though. Ah. <laughs> it's close to that. I thought that's yeah, pretty, no, no. That's so, pretty so it's, dangerous. It, it was, no, so what I did when I, I took over a year ago, I kept my same email, and it's, by the way, it's ed.bastion at delta.com. Uh, and everyone said, you got to change it, you got to have a secret email, you got to have a, you know, kind of a, so, so only really important people get to you. Right. And I said, I don't, the poor people will find me anyway. I want, I want to know what people think about us. I want to be accessible. I want our employees to be able to reach me. I want our customers yeah. to reach me. I've got, yeah, I've got people, and I can't, I can't respond personally to every, but I read every single one of them. I see everything that comes in, and I get many, you know, I get, I get people that with, with their complaints or their, their travel stories. I get almost as many positive stories of, 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 of heroic 
uh, service that people and thanking us for what we do. And, um, and so I, I, I decided I'm going to keep that and make, make my, I, I want to be accessible. Yeah. You could make like two piles. You know, when you're really having a rough day, you read the good, you read the good letters. <laughs> Who get, has I questions? Get. Somebody's running around with microphones. One back here. And uh, here's the question, I think, from the investment community, often scratching our heads. How is it different this time, this right. cycle, uh, over capacity, the boom and bust, if you will, over many, many decades? If you could just share some insight, how you sure. and your colleagues think about that. Sure. Well, I spent all morning with the investment community up here today, so I was over at Fidelity and Loomis, and we had a large investor, uh, investor group. It, it is different this time. You know, this, th we've, we've now made... Uh, $6 billion in profits and a 15% margin twice, two years in a row. I think we'll make it again. That range the third year in a row. What, what's different? Well, the, the main thing that's different is that you have companies that are investing for, for their, their product and the quality of service rather than price. Price is always going to be an important element, but you've got companies that are investing in improving the, the, the value of what we bring to customers. We have won for the last six years in a row Business Travel News Award as the best airline for business travelers in the globe. And we are very proud of that. And we're going to continue to invest in that. That makes the relationship on the revenue side very sticky. We have variableized our cost structure. So while I talk about I'm very proud of our profit sharing payout, the billion dollars that we've paid out each of the last three years, guess what? If something were to happen and we were having a, a, a kind of a, a reduction uh, in revenues, that's an automatic reset for our people, rather than us having to go in and take money out of their pocket, which I promised I will never do again, personally. But we'll, we'll, what we have is, is a profit-sharing formula that self-corrects and self-adjusts. We have increased staffing models. You know, we don't fly the airline today like we flew it 15 years ago. 15 years ago, you could count on the schedule, and it looked the same way on a Monday in January as a Wednesday in the summer year-round. You know, we're now, we fly 25% more in the summer than we do in the winter because that's the demand peak and you, you get more capacity there. Uh, our debt load is, is way down. As I said, we had $20 billion of debt. We've got, you know, we, we're, arguably we have, don't have enough debt uh, on our balance sheet today. So there's been a lot of structural changes. The other thing we've done is that we've expanded globally. So if any issue were to occur in one part of the world, we now have operations on a, on a, on a truly global basis. Over 40% of our revenues are global, not just in the domestic marketplace. We're going to close tomorrow on a acquisition of Aeromexico. So Delta will be the principal owner of Aeromexico. We're going to own 49% of Aeromexico, which is the largest amount that we can own as, a, as an international airline. And uh, we'll be the first big company making an investment in Mexico with the new administration, and I'm damn proud of it and whatnot. And this has, this has been a deal we've been working with our Mexican colleagues for some time. And we're going to bring you know, the Mexican and the U.S. Uh, businesses closer together to provide greater opportunities for both to uh, grow. And we did that with uh, Branson in, in Virgin. We're, we're doing that in Korea. So there's many, many things. It, 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 it's not the same business. It's not even close to the same business that, that it was. And, but I, I appreciate that time will tell. And we have to prove it. We just can't say it. And uh, I think the fact that Mr. Buffett has signed on to it is a pretty good, uh, pretty good sign that things are different. Hey, Ed, the other thing I wanted to um, mention you this morning, you also got another award. We did. We did. For best, best place to work. We, we on Fortune came out with their best places to work uh, list today, their, their annual issue. One of, I think it's their most popular issue that they come out with. And for the first time, uh, Delta was named one of, the, one of the top places to work in, in America. And you're the only airline. Uh, on, only airline on the list of the top 100. We came in, we made our debut at 63. Uh, very, very proud of that. First time, uh, I say first time, but 30 years ago, Delta was there. Um, and I'm um, just so proud that we've got it, we've got it back. So they, we're, we're real happy. Yeah, it's we're great. Happy. Congratulations. Proud, we're really proud of our people. Yeah. Paul, you have a... So, oh, I guess we need a mic. You talked about the need for infrastructure improvements, including at airports. And right. you mentioned a number of cities and airports. You had one phrase mentioning Boston. Mm -hmm. It's challenging. Mm -hmm. Could you expand on that? Well, there's, uh, you're, you're in the midst of, uh, of an investment you know, improvement for the, uh, for the airport here. We've got a, uh, we've got a wonderful facility here uh, that Delta built 15 years ago. 
together with Massport. And unfortunately, it opened right before 9-11. And as we all know what happened after 9-11, the airlines shrunk, and we wound up having to bring other airlines into, the, into the, our facility that we, we built to just pay for the cost of it. We're, we're now in a position where Delta's starting, and I, I told our team, we're going to get that, that full facility back over the next couple of years and fill it up. We're, we're back up to the summer. We'll have 100 flights a day. Uh, in Boston. I think it had dropped down you know, markedly lower than that. And I'd like to get it back to close to 150 flights a day and so that we can have, have that, that facility fully utilized, including international, which we're, we've got uh, Dublin, which we're launching this summer uh, out of Boston. So it's a, uh, I, I don't want to speak to that. I know, I know we got the, the leadership of Massport in the room, so I don't want to speak to them. You probably, you, probably, you probably should ask them. I'm going to be meeting with them after this, so I don't want to be, I don't want to be uh, taken to the woodshed. But, uh, but I'll tell you, the Delta facility is great. Uh, I'd say the main issue that we have with the facility is, is the TSA and the security queue is still not, doesn't move with the pace and the speed that we need it to go. Great. Who else do we have? Pam, you wanna? Oops. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, so Delta burns a lot of fuel. Um, uh, What's Delta doing to address uh, climate change, and do you think that to ensure a level playing field, uh, there should be uh, regulation of airlines or uh, air travel to address climate change? Uh, no, I don't think we, I, I think we need to be accountable for it, yeah. And we are, and we've, we've committed as an industry, and Delta has signed up as a part of the industry to reduce our footprint by 2% per year on a compounded rate for the next five years, and at that point, we'll reassess in terms of how much more we can do. Uh, we, are, we have had, a, in fact, we're, we've been doing an even better job than that over, over the last number of years. Uh, you think about all the new engine technology that we're, uh, we're bringing to the market. Uh, the new engines that we're bringing in are over 20% more fuel efficient than the, the planes and the engines that we're retiring. We're bringing you know, one of our, our biggest opportunities in regional jets. You know, we have these small regional jets that we all fly around. Five years ago, Delta had over 550 seat or smaller planes. Today, we have 125. And what we've done is we haven't gotten smaller. We've taken those customers and brought them up to the main line and whatnot. And we've got larger, larger planes, much more environmentally and fuel efficient. You know, it's not just the environmental impact, it's the financial impact, too, that really matters to us. And so we're doing, we're doing as well as I think any industry out there. Uh, no question, we've got to do better. Uh, but as an industry, we, you know, we, we think we need to be held accountable, and, and thus far, we're signing up to it. One more. Oh, I thought you were giving me the one more question signal. Depends on how long the question is. There you go, Pam. Hey, Pam. No. <laughs> uh, thank you for being here. Today. Sure, it's my uh, pleasure. I spend a ton of time on the shuttle. I'm a big fan of the Biscoff cookies, so thank you for that. Good. Uh, I'm curious to hear you talk a little bit about how you're directing innovation toward the customer experience, particularly with a focus on millennials. Yeah. And what do we have to look forward to? Well, the uh, our, our digital strategy is 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 what we're what we're developing. You know, we got the uh, our our uh, mobile app. I think is pretty good. I don't think it's where it needs to be quite yet. Uh, we now have over forty percent of our tickets that we have that come through our own website. So customers are are increasingly coming to us, and the more the the closer the direct connect relationship you can build with your customers, the better you can do in terms of servicing them and having, having access to them and building that relationship that I talk about. Uh, there are others out there that try to inter, uh, disintermediate us, but we try to drive as much of the, the connectivity. One of the challenges the airlines have is that we all have very, very large uh, legacy infrastructures. Uh, we had, a, unfortunately, a, a, a meltdown in, in August last year where we lost, the, the, the systems went down, and it took us three days before we got everything fully back up and running. We're in the process of building a, t a new technology center this, uh, this, that will be up this summer that will have the resiliency where that won't happen again. But in the meantime, we've got to anticipate and meet the new needs of our customer base while at the same time operating on scale with the historic infrastructure uh, challenges that we have. So some of the new startup airlines don't have to worry about that. They can kind of build new, uh, new innovation sooner. But, but I think we're doing a pretty good job. And uh, I think we're going to do a better job. We're going to do a better job. I think it would be great to have um, if the guy in front of me couldn't put his seat right back into my lap. That would help my experience. That just a little it. input. You can, you can zap him somehow? <laughs> I can, just a, a little shock. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what do we have time for, Warren? We have time for one more? Stop. Go ahead. Stop.
Das, go on. Be our last question. <laughs> there you go. It's always dangerous to be the last question. Um, so I, I have a question for you on um, going back to this client experience thing, talking about loyalty. Yep. And um, you guys did invent the loyalty program. That was somebody else. But it seems like lately everyone's following your lead on the invention of that. So I'm curious, uh, sort of as a first question, where you think that's going? And as a second question, as a very frequent traveler, is there going to be a time when we can safely assume that everyone knows how to buckle a seatbelt? <laughs> uh, Second question, probably not. Um, first time, yeah, uh, yeah we, we, made a, we made a significant change to our loyalty arrangement a couple years ago. And it was like changing social security. Uh, we decided that we were gonna reward loyalty based on the value of the relationship that people pay versus just how long they sat in a seat. And it's controversial and there's been a, it's been a transition to it and others have followed us in there. Uh, a lot of people don't like it. Uh, in fact, after all, our program is called Sky Miles. You know, and then they wonder what's, what happened to the miles part of it. Uh, but when you think about it, in fairness, we would have a person say, sitting, paying $500 for a ticket, sitting next to someone who paid $100 a ticket, which is what you have on our cabin. You know, there's, a, there's an argument that $500 person should get more rewarded you know, for what they do. And you see that in the hotel industry, you see in a lot of industries, banking. But you know, the airlines, because they were the, the inventors of loyalty, never made that transition. So we, we ripped off the bandage, we've made, we've made the change. Uh, I've got a lot of people that are very happy about it. They don't talk to me, of course, about it. The, the people that talk to me are the people that are unhappy about it. You know, the people that are happy, you say, well, about time you, you, you made, that, made that adjustment. But you know, one of the things we're looking to do is try to turn that currency into a real currency of value. You, know, you can pay, pay you know, for your air tickets with your, with your sky miles. You can, you can buy things with it, and you can continue to invest it. We've got a great program with American Express, which is our, our credit card provider. Uh, that we generate today, uh, we are the largest co-brand that American Express has. Uh, in fact, I heard a stat the other day that 20% of the Amex revolving credit is the Delta, the Delta card. So it's, it's a very popular currency and they pay, they pay a significant amount uh, for it of revenue, which, which is good for us because it helps us keep our fares down and continue to compete in the marketplace. But loyalty is, you know, when, when people historically have talked about the airlines, you know, why do you shop in airlines? Price, schedule, and loyalty. Uh, we've changed it, we've added a fourth, and that's quality of service. And we think quality of service should try to rise closer to the top of the consideration queue, and that's what we're doing, and I think that's what's changing it, that's what's driving our margins, that's what's driving our revenue performance, and it's certainly what's keeping our people you know, really happy, because they love doing that, they love doing that. So, anyway, I thank you all for, uh, I know we got a lot of travel. Thank Stop you, Thank you for your business, appreciate it.